To move the chest during respiration requires muscles. And there are three sets of muscles involved. There are the muscles of the chest wall. These are the serratus anterior and posterior, the trapezius of the neck, the pectoralis major and minor, rectus abdominis, the abdominal muscles down here. They are all involved in respiration when you're having forced respiration, such as when you're exercising, or if you have such severe lung disease that you need to maximize your ventilatory capacity. The second set of muscles which are important are the intercostal muscles. So these are muscles that run between each rib, and they're divided into three, categories, three types. There's the external, which is on the outside, the internal, which is in between, and then the subcostal, which is the most inferior layer, the closest to the parietal pleura. And finally, there is the diaphragm. Um, so the intercostals are used for inspiration, and the diaphragm is used for inspiration as well. When you have forced expiration, i.e. when you're exercising, you'll also recruit these muscles for that process as well. So to talk about the intercostals in a little bit more detail, these cross between each rib and are the main skeletal muscles of respiration. So the external ones, which are the outer layer, they run obliquely downwards anteriorly. That means that when they contract, they lift the ribs up and out and expand the chest. And they are one of the main drivers of inspiration. The internals run obliquely downwards posteriorly and they pull the ribcage back down again and therefore are used during forced expiration but are not necessary, you, are not necessary for normal expiration. The subcostal muscles uh, run vertically and, they're, in between, and they're, they're the bottom layer and they are actually underneath the intercostal vein artery and nerve. The clinical relevance of the intercostals is that if you have a problem affecting the skeletal muscle, such as motor neuron disease, then that can also lead to a lung hypoventilation, underventilation of the lung, and potentially respiratory failure. And in fact, that is the mode of death for many patients with end-stage muscle disease, such as motor neuron disease and muscular dystrophies. This is a diagram, cross-section of the, of the chest wall at the level of the, the diaphragm uh, and you can see here the intercostals, which are at the top part of this diagram, with the external intercostal on the outside, the middle layer being the internal, and the, the underneath layer being the subcostal just next to the lung. The diaphragm has that shape where it curves up between the lung and the liver on that side, on the, on the left-hand side, between the lung and the spleen and the stomach. And then there's an extra layers of skin and subcutaneous tissue and extra thoracic muscle uh, and, uh, outside of that. The diaphragm itself is a smooth muscle. It's placed under each lung between the thoracic cavity and the abdomen. It has a central tenderness area, and it is essentially the main muscle of respiration. When it contracts, it makes the muscle smaller, and that pulls a domed diaphragm flatter, and that will expand the lungs downwards. The diaphragm rises from insertions on the xiphoid process anteriorly, the vertebrae back posteriorly, and the bottom six ribs around each side. In general, the upper limit of the diaphragm is on the fifth rib during at rest, uh, and is slightly higher on the, on the right-hand side than the left due to the presence of the liver beneath it on the right-hand side. Diaphragmatic movements and contractions are controlled by the phrenic nerve, which arises from the cervical three, four, and five nerve roots. That's important because without that phrenic nerve, the diaphragm will not move. If you have a bilateral phrenic nerve palsy, for example, if somebody uh, has a cervical lesion above C3, 4, or 5 at C2, then they will die from respiratory failure unless there, some form of mechanical ventilation is used because neither diaphragm is moving. There are three openings in the diaphragm, and these are important because they are sites of herniation. So, for example, a hiatus hernia often comes up through the opening for the esophagus and the vagus posteriorly behind the heart and is visible on a chest X-ray. And the hiatus hernia represents stomach tissue, the stomach moving through the diaphragmatic opening into the thoracic cavity. The other openings are for the aorta and the inferior vena cava. This is a diagram of the diaphragm. You can see the dome of the right and the left hemidiaphragm, the sort of slightly gray area in the middle is the tenderness process. And you can see how the diaphragm arises posteriorly from the vertebra of these insertions onto each vertebral body, from the costochondral margin and the ribs around the side, and the xiphoid process anteriorly. And this diagram clearly shows that sort of that the dome shape of the diaphragm is when it contracts, it will shorten, and that dome will flatten, and that expands the lungs. 
You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions, customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.